Our first speaker is Seo Kim from uh, Seoul National University, and he will tell us about advances in 5D and 6D quantum field theories. I'd like to also start by thanking all the organizers for this perfect organization. And I, it's also my great pleasure to have a chance to overview uh, the, uh, the recent progresses that we had in higher dimensional quantum field theory. So more precisely, I'll have to do the following three things today. Okay, I'm going to review higher dimensional field theories. And considering this broad audience, I try to make things as non-technical as possible, trying to give you the streamline of the progress as we progresses that we had, and hopefully to give you some future ideas on how we could proceed. We, all, uh, we also had a very great review talk by Kumnun uh, in the last Rings conference, so it will be efficient if I can try my best to uh, minimize the overlap with these ones. And uh, we had lots of progresses in higher dimensional quantum field theories in the past few years. Uh, Kumnun covered basically almost everything. Uh, and, and considering various situations, I thought it would be wiser to uh, focus on advances that we had in recent years about high dimensional field theories with exactly computable observables with the help of supersymmetries, because there has been some maturation of these techniques in, in recent uh, 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 decades or so. And I'll try to deliver some lessons, concrete lessons that like, we can learn about uh, the higher dimensional field theories from these, uh, uh, anal these observables. So to compl complement the scope of my talk, uh, I realize that there has been some very excellent reviews of, uh, of uh, higher dimensional quantum field theory, some aspects of it, during the past uh, uh, conference. So please refer to it if you are interested. So the simple plan is the following. I'll give you some minimal background materials. And the remaining things I'll try to keep very simple. Uh, Considering that it's a review, I'll try to keep my scope not that broad because I just wanted to give you concrete examples and give you some feelings on how we could actually do some non-trivial analysis of these challenging systems despite lots of constraints and restrictions, no microscopic descriptions and so on. And then, hoping that some time remains, I'll try to at least briefly summarize some other interesting directions and ideas which have been studied to a certain extent, interesting works, but I hope, uh, uh, which I think uh, 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 will play a much more important role in the future. Uh, there are many ideas waiting for us to be, uh, waiting for us to uh, uh, explore better, especially with some advances in recent techniques. So I'll start by briefly overviewing some aspects of six and five dimensional conformal field theories and try to elaborate on a little bit more gradually. Uh, especially really the materials that I need today. So, no Lagrangians, we don't know it. All the six and five dimensional conformal field theories has been direct, discovered indirectly from string theory. So, in six dimension, the superconformal symmetry falls into two classes, either maximal or minimal supersymmetric ones. They're all chiral, so the maximal supersymmetric ones we call the two zero theories. A subclass of them has been discovered on the world volume of M5 planes, and why the class of them has been discovered in type 2b string theory by putting them on a specific orbifold of ADE type, which has a six-dimensional locus where the field theory lives. There's no Lagrangian description or microscopic description known which has enough covariance. Okay. To get a feeling on, uh, a little bit of feeling on why it should be challenging to have some microscopic description, you might want to think about a situation where we compactify the uh, system on a torus. We know very well that if the torus size is small, the system reduces down to maximal super young mills with AD gauge groups. Okay? And there, these systems are very well known to have the property called S duality. Okay? These are non perturbative properties of young mills theory. And over the, um, from more than 20 years ago, we had some heroic efforts by many, many, uh, many, many of our seniors uh, trying to understand some aspects of this S duality. But if you try to understand this from the conjectured quantum field theories in higher dimension, they are manifested in a very, very simple manner. Okay? Um, for, for instance, in four-dimensional gauge theories, the difficulty in studying this s duality might be addressed to the fact that electric and magnetic particles are treated so, on so much unequal footing. On the other hand, all these electric and magnetic particles have very simple and coherent higher-dimensional origin from this six-dimensional two-zero theory. For instance, uh, so in six dimensions, there are objects which are called strings, the self-dual strings, which I'll elaborate on more later. 
And the way, the way we get electric and magnetic particles are simply obtained by wrapping these strips, strings in two different directions of the torus. So presumably, if you get a covariant enough microscopic description of these two zero theories, you're going to get a much better understanding on actuality. And for those who are seeking for such a thing, this might be an exciting news or it might be discouraging news because it's a really, really challenging thing we already know. There are many more minimal supersymmetric theories. Various models have been discovered either from brains or from geometry. Also, if you compactify these systems on a torus, we get an even more challenging system. At low energy, we get uh, 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 isolated conformal field theories with no Lagrangian description at all in four dimensional already. So it, the understanding the microscopic description of this will be challenging in, also. There are five dimensional conformal field theories as well, which has been discovered 21 years ago. Uh, I, I, yeah. uh, there are many examples by now as well, but presumably the simplest model would be the class of model discovered by Cyborg. And these models are realized on the world volume of type 2 AD4 brains, uh, which probes some oriented fold A planes and a, uh, B8 brains in the limit where certain, uh, gauge, uh, certain couplings are becoming large. Okay? So these A planes and A brains are making some these linear profiles of uh, dilaton fields in the, super, in the string theory. And if the full brain is probing it, it's seeing some coupling constant that, uh, as its gauge coupling on the five dimensional gauge theories on its world volume. If you further take the strong coupling limit, it, it, uh, the, on the default brain, it will be realized uh, uh, five-dimensional superconformal field theory, which is strongly interacting. There are more ways of engineering these theories, either from geometry or from brains, and especially understanding, uh, especially uh, the brain engineering uh, gets easier if you use the webs of five brain. So on the web of D5 brain, you get some SU2 gauge theory description. Do you take the similar limit as this one to make a singular intersection of five brains? And at the low cost of singular intersection, five dimensional CFTs are leaking. Also, if you compactify, the, also no microscopic descriptions are known about it. If you compactify on S1, it's related to a, a similarly challenging four dimensional isolated conformal field theories of the sort that I have mentioned in the previous slide. So, one can ask, how can you study this system without microscopic descriptions? The first kind of answer I can give, you to, give to you is uh, quite a responsible one, maybe. We use string theory to discover it, so you use string theory to study it, if you can. Also, we get lots of great intuitions from effective quantum field theories obtained after deforming these conformal field theories by various massive parameters. It provides great intuitions and uh, uh, help us to define and study many interesting observables. In this course, it will be helpful to uh, understand uh, various lower dimensional quantum field theory techniques. In the deformed conformal field theory, you'll encounter various massive particles and tension for strings. Understanding them uh, provides a lot of interesting clues about the conformal field theory itself, as I'll explain to you today uh, with s several examples. So the one dimensional quantum field theory techniques, living on these massive particles and strings in some deformed conformal field theory, will also be some provide some helpful window to understand this system better. So, with these in mind, let me try to explain to you what kind of deformations of conformal, superconformal field theories in five and six dimensions we have. And I'll take advantage of this setting uh, to set up a, a certain class of interesting problems and compute that and try to explain to you how we can take advantage of it to study some interesting physics. So the five and six dimensional conformal field theories has uh, various kinds of massive, massive deformations. In five dimension, it's based, there are basically two kinds. First of all, you can deform the conformal field theory by irrelevant operators whose coefficients are masses. And a particular class of mass deformation yields at low energy a five dimensional effective Young-Mills theory description, where the massive parameters are given by the inverse coupling of the Young-Mills theory uh, because the theory is non-renormalizable. These are the all kinds of Young-Mills theory, which I explained to you in D4, D5 brain settings before, before you take the strong coupling limit. And in, in this kind of viewpoint, all the other masses correspond to something like Quark masses and its supersymmetrization uh, having to do with and which breaks the global symmetries of the system. 
There are also another interesting branch that I'll pay uh, much more attention to, which is going to certain branches by giving expectation value to scalar field. You can give expectation value to hypermultiplets or vector multiplets. What we'll be interested in the Coulomb branch, uh, which is obtained by giving expectation value to the scalar in the vector multiplet in 5D. In six dimension, you can only deform the theory by going to certain branches, either into the hypermultiplet Higgs branches or to another branch called tensor branch, which is my main interest today. So the tensor branch is obtained by giving expectation value to a scalar, which is sitting in another su possible supersymmetric multiplet, which is called the self dual tensor multiplet. So you have a two form potential whose field strengths are constrained to be uh, having equal, and equal electric and magnetic field strengths. So if you give expectation value to several tensor multiplets that you have, there could be several interesting, uh, there could be a couple of interesting effective field theory descriptions from which we can get some intuitions and ideas. So if the theory only has a tensor multiplet, like the case of two zero theories, if you go to generic point in the tensor branches, uh, you, you have just a bunch of free abelian tensor theories uh, if, uh, action in the infrared or equation of motion in the infrared. If there are some vector multiplets, the structure becomes more interesting. You can get more lessons out of it. So if there are extra vector multiplets on, the top of, on top of tensor multiplets, the, the, the low energy effective action is described in this branch by an interesting Young Mills tensor and optionally matter couple theory, where the expectation value of the tensor multiplet field sets up the Young Mills constant, Young Mills coupling constant. It has the kinetic term for the tensor branch field, the bosonic part I, I showed. And there's a tensor vector coupling term, where this term effectively gives rise to uh, uh, the Young Mills kinetic term in the tensor branch. And a partner term that you see here is coupling the uh, instant on number density, F wedge F, to the two form potential, giving uh, sort of sourcing them. The reason why I'm interested, there are many reasons, but some reason why I'm interested in studying observables in this branch is that, um, well, firstly, it's like uh, studying the four dimensional gauge theories, going into, into Coulomb branch and studying Dion spectrum. Okay? That turns out to be an extremely interesting subject in four dimensions. I can say that these branches are as analogous as I can go to that kind of settings in higher dimensions. And there will be various massive particles and string-like observables. You can also do some BPS state counting problems here, although the nature of BPS states are very different from four dimensions. So you can define and study various interesting observables related to objects in this branch. But these objects, may, you may think, that has very little to do with the conformal field theory that we are interested in, because you deform the CFTs with various massive parameters. I'll be studying some written index like uh, partition functions, uh, which has temperature like chemical potential in this setting. And you can see some hints of you, conformal field theory physics if you take these temperature like variables high enough. So you naturally expect that some physics at the high temperature will, will not be affected by the small mass deformation that you have introduced. I'll explain to you this idea at some point of my talk after I explain to you how the computation and also have, have been done. And also, there have been recently, uh, recently over five or some years like that, some interesting proposals, proposals about uh, a more natural conformal field theory observables living on curved space time, about five and six dimensional CFTs. And uh, in these proposals, these tensor branch observables or Coulomb branch observables are heavily used. So it allows you to, uh, with this proposed answer, study certain physics or aspects of conformal field theories, inspiring many people to have better ideas about uh, the structures of it. So, on this slide, let me try to give a brief overview to you on what the objects we are going to be interested, what kind of objects we're going to be interested in this de in these deformed branches. In six dimensions, there are basically one kind of object. We call it self dual strings. It's the kind of stringy objects that couples the self-dual uh, tensor multiplet with equal electric and magnetic charges. And in the string theory engineering, there are basically two kinds of examples. If the CFT is related to the brain construction, you separate the five brains to go to tensor branch and suspend M2 brains, which gives you the strings. If it's engineered by geometry, either a 2B or F theory on singular uh, uh, internal space, the singularity is blown up to a bunch of two cycles, uh, which is going to the tensor branch, and you give expectation value to the, uh, you, you wrap three brains uh, along certain two cycles to get the strings. Especially in case if there's a six-dimensional gauge group, you get a better intuition of it. For instance, you have some V brains along with it, 
you have some seven brains wrapping it, you have some gauge groups in six dimensions. Then, by recalling the action that I wrote to you uh, on the previous slide and getting the equation of motion, imposing the self duality condition by hand, you notice that this instant on number density of the gauge, gauge field is sourcing this, this uh, uh, electric and magnetic field strength of H. So, if you consider these anti self dual or self dual instantons under the transverse alpha slice of the sixth dimension, they are becoming the soliton strings, which are interpreted as the infrared uh, realization of these self dual strings. Uh, uh, yeah, self dual strings. In five dimensions, there are many interesting objects if you go to deformed branch, definite coupling, if you go to Coulomb branch, and so on. What you get are something like quarks, W bosons in this gauge theory description language. They are regarded as perturbative uh, elementary particles in this language. You can have some solitonic particles by, in, in this brainwave description giving rise to D1, D5 brains. So these are particles in this effective theory, which are, which are realized as the same mathematical structure of, of young mills instantons, now becoming a massive particle. You can also have some strings by wrapping D3 brains, uh, filling a, a phase of these uh, uh, five brain wraps. So one more setting that I'll have be, to be in, in introducing to you is the compactification, compactification of the six-dimensional CFT on a circle. Uh, with another length or mass scale, which is the Kaluza Klein mass scale. One reason I'm emphasizing this kind of setting is because, especially in the M5 brain setting, M theory itself has been originally discovered in the form compactified on a circle, in which you can use type 2a description in the special regimes. Okay? So, for instance, if your other energy scale of interest is much smaller than the Kaluza Klein energy mass scale, you can use uh, the so-called D0, D4 description, quantum mechanical description, to study this uh, M5 brain sector with definite colors of climb momentum K. And it's described by this follow simple D0, D4 quantum mechanics, which you'll notice as uh, an ADH in quantum mechanics of young mills instantons if you have uh, uh, heard of this, uh, uh, if you have thought of this young mills instanton problem ever. Okay? And, and the point of this kind of construction is that uh, we can study a sector of six-dimensional QFT uh, in certain parameter regimes, when radius is smaller than any other, qu other quantities appearing in the game, uh, by using sort of quantum mechanical gauge theories or so on at given k, a given uh, particle of uh, Klein momentum number k, and by summing over the contributions of this partition function, you can compute a kind of grand partition function uh, uh, for this momentum k, at, at least in certain parameter regimes. But if you're computing certain supersymmetric quantities and so on, like indices and so on, Often you can continue the computation made in special regime to other parameter regimes to get useful information. Sometimes you can, depending on situation, you can do so easily. Sometimes you meet singularity depending on model, so it makes us different. It, everything depends on models. So all I've told you so far is basically what we have been knowing from more than 20 years ago and what have been providing us important clues during that time about this system. What has been a new ingredient in these days is that the supersymmetric techniques has been matured so that we could really compute systematically the partition functions of wide classes of these objects that I explained to you in the previous slide, these strings and particles and so on. So I'm going to study in this, in this talk the, uh, uh, the, the partition function or written indices of the BPS objects, uh, which is co-dimension four. So there will be particles in five-dimensional CFT, strings in six-dimensional ones. The five-dimensional written index partition function can be defined in the following way. There are various global symmetries, angular momentum, R charge, or W boson numbers, or string winding, or other flavor charges, which you can use to weight the state to define an index. Okay? We don't know how to compute this index in an exceptional functional, exact functional form in most cases, uh, I think because due to the lack of the techniques. But in special parameter regimes, when one of the many flavors big S is, smaller, one of, is smaller than others, we know the coefficients of uh, the, the series expansion form of the grand partition function. Let's say if uh, 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 the coupling constant deformation has have been made so that the solitonic particle is much heavier than the, uh, the, the lighter ones, uh, the other ones, you expand this in this soliton particle number, and the coefficients are basically known as this necklace of instanton partition function. So you can compute it in particular reg regime, at least. The six-dimensional partition function can be computed. Uh, p p firstly, the quantity can be defined by compactifying the system on a circle, because you want to wrap the string there and compute the spectrum of them. Okay? 
So the one more parameters in the game, the fugacity conjugate to the, the, the momentum along this circle bound to these strings. Okay? So you can expand this in various combinations, and again, you can compute the coefficients exactly in many, many cases. First of all, if you expand the prime quantity in the fugacity for the momentum, you get the same kind of Microsoft partition function calculus, which is known for, let's say, for the D0D4 like system. So if you know some quantum mechanical uh, description, you can compute every coefficient. Alternatively, if you uh, expand the quantity in string winding numbers, the coefficients are given by the elliptic genus of the self dual strings wrapped on the torus. So in many cases, we can compute this and try to address some interesting properties of the CFTs. There are some certainties having to do with certain chemical potentials. I keep the information here for completeness, but uh, it's a bit technical, so I'll just pass it. Just to mention that some of the chemical potentials having to do with angular momentum are playing dual roles of normal chemical potentials or infrared regulators, because we're considering a non-compact space along which particles can propagate. So, I've explained to you that we can compute lots of coefficients in this is partition function indices, computing the spectrum of these uh, interesting objects. And there has been a lot of progress on having a 1D or two-dimensional quantum field theory description of them, which you can use to compute, the, compute all these coefficients. Especially they have been gauge theory description, living on this world volume of 1D or 2D objects. So because, and, and that has been combined with the recent advances in computing the elliptic genus or Witten index of such gauge theory to make very, very convincing computations of, inter, uh, of interesting indices. So first of all, if you know some two-dimensional gauge theory living on some of these self dual strings, uh, the BPS spectrum co uh, computed by the elliptic genus can be obtained by the work of these gentlemen in recent years. Uh, so it's basically a supersymmetric torus partition function. Uh, the idea is that if you have a gauge theory, you go to the UV or weakly coupled regime and use the weakly coupled technique to compute the path integral. So the issue is to, here is to t carefully take care of the bosonic and fermionic zero modes, and if you do that, the bosonic zero modes coming from the two holonomies of gauge theories on the torus uh, are required to take a particular contour integration or recit sums called the Jeffrey Cohen recit. In the one dimension, similar problem has been posed surprisingly long, long ago by Microsoft. So it's not recent, it's 15 years ago. Uh, but he had a, I, I, think, I think it was a really ingenious work in that he just uh, wrote down the contour to the best of my knowledge. So he did so with the motivation of studying the cyber witten theories of some interesting models for which he could write down the contour quite, uh, uh, not easily, but anyway, he wrote down the prescription. But recently, we tried to use this result to a more interesting models uh, applicable to five and six, uh, relevant for five and six dimensional CFTs. And then we got confused because contours and all so became so difficult. So we had to really derive the one dimensional index again for gauge theories following this gentleman's work. And, and there were extra certainties having to do with the one dimensional system, but basically we got a very similar expression. Now good. Now I so far explained the virtue of having gauge theory as uh, once we have a gauge theory, we can compute the index easily. But for most of the systems I explained to you, there are much more important virtue of that. It's not just because of technical comp computational uh, 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 feasibility that we are favoring to have gauge theories on these lower dimensional systems. It's more importantly because if you just rely on the soliton description have, uh, from a five or six dimensional effective quantum field theory, even in one or two dimension, you necessarily encounter incompleteness of this description which I interpret has to do with the UV incompleteness of the effective field theory in 5 or 6D. For instance, in ma many of the solitons that I've mentioned, especially if it has to do with Young-Mills instantons, it it's described in the soliton language by the nonlinear sigma models living on the modular space of these solitons, which is famously known to have singularities on its modular space. Okay? So due to this fact, the modular space itself doesn't know what to do if you, if, if you, if you have to approach these singular spaces, so it has to be UV completed. UV completing the 5 and 60 solitons will be extreme, uh, 5 and 60 CFTs, itself, QFTs itself will be a very difficult thing to do. But UV completing things in your smaller problem in the context of 1D or 2 dimensional quantum field theory in a specific parameter regime will be possible by, uh, by finding suitable 1 or 2 dimensional gauge theories or gauge linear signal models. Here, having, having singular 
uh, limit of the soliton uh, uh, soliton profile is quite simi uh, uh, quite uh, common even in four-dimensional gauge theories. We just interpret it as a singular saddle point of a quantum field theory, which are perfectly good at short distances if it's a renormalizable good quantum field theory. But the thing is that we should interpret the same, same mathematical phenomena differently in higher dimensions. Okay? So, the, so having some gauge theory like matrix model description for uh, singular saddle points in four-dimensional gauge theory is really just a technical tool to compute things better. This we really needed to do a complete calculations. So for instance, in the early days of this business, uh, some calculation of written index uh, using some wrong UV completion caused a lot of trouble because we didn't really carefully follow what string theory was asking us to do. So this is a kind of example which really doesn't have a counterpart, so I really think the interpretation has to be different. Okay? This point might have to be emphasized later in my talk. So with this kind of motivation, we have been, uh, many people including myself have been studying uh, partly with this motivation, have been studying the world volume gauge theories of various one or two dimensional solitons uh, in the recent few years. And uh, there are many, many examples, but uh, with the interest of saving time and also not to be too technical, I'll just give you what, explain to you one example, namely the strings of the AN minus one type two zero theory. So the easiest way of getting gauge theory from string theory is to use deep brains and open strings because that's the natural way gauge theory arises, a natural way. So the, the self theory strings in 2-0 theory started from M2 and M2, M5 brain system. So we deform it slightly to an NS5 brain and D2 brain system, where these are the, will be the UV descriptions of the self theory string quantum field theories. And on this world volume, we, we find the quiver gauge theories, prevailing a certain amount of supersymmetry. And what has been done by these authors, uh, uh, the, the ingenious thing that has been done by these authors is to add a little bit of deformation in this UV theory, add, adding one more brains and so on, in a way that computing the infrared observables becomes much more feasible and easier in this deformed version of the UV theory without affecting the infrared physics. So there are many UV theories that can float the same infrared physics. This is a slightly deformed version of the gauge theory obtained by this, basically filling one D6 brain. So this is the quiver that has been constructed for the self zero strings with definite, uh, uh, let's say, winding numbers along, e along each tensor branch node. Okay? This will be quite playing some important roles in the discussion, physics discussion I make later. I was quite tempted to make some showing off about technical advances in studying these quantum gauge theories for various strings and so on, but uh, I'll refrain from that. Now, so I, I think I explained to you certain settings and certain calculational methods which allows us to address, uh, which allows us to get, sort of compute the deformed conformal field theories partition function or indices. Now I can ask you the question, I can ask myself the question, what kind of good things can you do with it? What kind of conformal field theories can you start study with that? So I'll try to give you two examples where this kind of physical studies can be made. First idea is the following, which I'll be explaining to you in the next three transparencies or so. So first of all, as I explained to you, the partition function that I've been studying has lots of parameters of chemical potentials, so some of which can be interpreted, uh, although in the index version, a temperature-like variable. So if you can study the really high temperature-like limit of this index partition function, it may be able to overcome all the massive deformations I introduced and asymptotically tell us some interesting conformal field theory physics. So let me explain to you what we can do in the two zero theory. Actually, that's what has been done, only thing that has been done so far, but I think many things can be generalized to one zero and other theories, hopefully. So the two zero theory partition function I introduced to you is, in a sense, a partition function on R4 times T2. One is spatial circle, one is temporal circle. And there are many, many parameters I've introduced with mass scales, the radius of the circle, the tensor multiplex expectation value, and a mass or chemical potential parameter for enhanced R symmetry in the 2 0 theory. Okay? Uh, effectively breaking the 2 0 superconformal field theory to less, uh, super, super symmetry to less. And I've introduced another angular momentum background, which roughly corresponds to giving a regularized volume of this non compact space. But, but the thing I'd like to do is to pick one of them, the temperature, 
uh, conjugate the Kaluza Klein momentum of the compactified circle to be large and try to study some asymptotic behaviors of these partition functions. It ap apparently might look very difficult from, let's say, the D0, D4 description of the compactified system because we only know the low temperature expansion via necklace of partition function very well. Note that this fugacity can be written in this way, and tau in this picture is the complex structure of the torus. So to study this kind of questions, this moment I'd like to ask the intermediate problem, whether in this partition function we have S-duality. I think this is a valid question to ask because at least when the torus size is small, as I introduced to you at the earlier part, we have n equal four superangles or mass deformed versions of that for which S-duality is uh, widely believed to be true and, 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 and lots of evidences that we know. And if that exists, supposing that exists in this partition function, it will co convert the coupling, uh, 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 the complex structure parameters in a way that it connects the high temperature and low temperature region. Former being the regime of inter our interest, lower being the regime where we can make easier studies. But having said that, we can immediately expect that SDRs cannot be exact because the expected uh, behavior of the free energies are completely different. At low energy, it comes from weakly coupled D4 brain dynamics, so it's perturbed to the n squared degrees of freedom. At high temperature, if this is an interesting observable at all, uh, it may scale like n cubed degrees of freedom in the most interesting scenario. And if this happens, SDRs cannot match these two exactly. So the scenario should be that either SDRs doesn't exist or it exists, but in observable is so boring, maybe due to both Fermi cancellations, so we don't learn nothing about it. The answer turns out to be an interesting compromise of the two. And the result is the following. The s is not there, but the anomaly of s is so simple in the free energy, so we can can't compute it exactly. It contains a term proportional to n cube, so that it balances the mismatch of the expected uh, uh, behavior of the high and low temperature free energies. There are many derivations. You can do that all with this alpha times T2 deformed CFT partition functions I, I explained to you. There are many ways of getting hints of it, deriving it in a sense, and reconfirming it. But one way I'll explain to you how to show it is to make an expansion, of one of the two expansions of the alpha times T2 partition function, I explained to you, uh, and do it in terms of the winding number of this f string. If you do this expansion, I explained to you that the coefficient is the elliptic general of self dual strings with definite winding number, and I explained to you the complete quiver gauge theory, which is supposed to compute this coefficient. Okay? So this is the result. It may look complicated, and as usual in this kind of business, it uh, admits a kind of young tabular sum formulation, but you don't have to know the details. Just need to know that it's a sum of ratio of the simple Jacobi's theta function so that you have a complete control. So you plug in the S-dual modular dry dualized parameter. It's related to itself with a simple anomalous term. So this is the S-duality anomaly that we'll be discussing with. And you know this anomaly is in the coefficient. Basically, you can trace what's the anomaly of this partition function. And for the technical reason uh, that I won't explain to you in too much detail, but I can talk to you later if you want, I'll be studying the limit in which the regulator chemical potential is sent to infinity so that the free energy will become roughly this divergent factor, something like a volume factor roughly of R4 times this coefficient. I'll be studying the effect of the s anomaly acting on this. If you know the cyborg written theory well, of course this is called the quantum part of the free potential. In our context, we're gonna study it as a free energy, a limit of the written index and the high temperature limit. So the anomaly can be induced. Uh, anomaly uh, loss transformation of this kind kind of quantity can be deduced well, uh, and the result can be summarized as follows. You have, it's convenient to de uh, decompose this uh, free energy into three parts. First of all, coming from the abelian part, coming from the n abelian tensor multiplets of the separated M5 brain, and the rest is a non-abelian part. To state the result neatly, it's again convenient to decompose into these two parts. The last part uh, will be what I'll be calling the anomalous transformation part, which is proportional to n cubed minus n, fourth power of the chemical potential, and it's proportional to what's called the uh, second Eisenstein series, which is notoriously well known for having some weird transformation property on the S-duality modular transformation. It's one of the quasi-modular forms. So the way I decompose it this way is that S-dual F defined this way is transforming in the standard way under the uh, S-duality transformation. 
So the consequence of this anomaly says that this FSTL in this limit transforms as follows. So the STL lies free energy, FSTL part, is related to the original one by a simple Django transformation. Again, many of you will realize that it's very natural because in four-dimensional cyborg theory, this is what you get the electromagnetic duality transformation. It's basically saying that the electromagnetic duality transformation is amounting to doing S duality transformation. More precisely, if you take the four-dimensional small torus limit of the left-hand side, you can show that this equals to this using some scaling properties of four-dimensional free potential. And it really says that the effect of doing S dualization and electromagnetic dual description change bring you to the original description, which is the usual four-dimensional S duality of mass deformed n equal to super, n equal four superangular theory. This is a curious extension of that into six dimension. Anyway, anyway, the message is that once you know this complete anomalous transformation, for studying the high temperature limit of this, you can use the dual low temperature limit in, in, and in favorable situation, plug in the weakly coupled or low temperature perturbative contribution here to do the calculus. The rest of the two terms are so simple so that we can compute the high temperature behavior explicitly. And then explaining all this, you won't be surprised to find this kind of expression. So the asymptotic free energy that I find firstly contains a term proportional to n square coming from the FS dual part, plugging in the dual perturbative contribution. This is a technical constraint that I had to put to do some calculation. And the rest of the term comes from the two anomalous part, proportional to n cubed minus n and n. So it contains a definite term proportional to n cubed, and if you keep the chemical potential rest of them fixed and take larger limit, you, formally, you see a term that is proportional to n cubed, seeing that the free energy is scaling like n cubed in a particularly chosen larger n limit. Of course, I have to interpret this term carefully. Of course, if you plug in f, f, m equals to zero, you get the most boring thing as possible. You get zero. And the interpretation of this is that this chemical potential is breaking the maximal supersymmetry of this uh, to zero theory or maximal super young mill theory into half, so that if it, if it takes into z take it to zero, this observable is becoming very boring. It has perfect Boltzmann cancellation, and you just don't see anything. Okay, so I keep this prime to fix to see some kind of Ramnon effect even after some partial cancellation between Boson and fermionic degrees of freedom. So I, th that's the interpretation of this term. So although it's very indirect, I think it's a very promising and curious. Uh, uh, a signal that this kind of system could be in, in, uh, uh, exhibiting the n cubed degrees of freedom in its, in its spectrum, presumably due to the roles of having uh, light D0 brain degrees of freedom. I think more interpretation or careful mechanism study has to be done, but I think this is a very encouraging signal. Just to make the status of this most important term uh, more solid, we have been providing an alternative computation of this term. Uh, by using some techniques of studying the high temperature limits of uh, 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 some partition functions or indices. Okay? So basically, if you compactify the six-dimensional background of us onto a small temporal circle, you, can, you get various background fields, and you can write down the five-dimensional effective actions for these background fields. And there's a particular term, five-dimensional gauge non-invariant transignment term, that is required to be turned on with particular coefficient to match the six-dimensional Tufta anomalies. So one can show that this part of the term can be completely reproduced by this part of the Tufta anomalies, giving a reconfirmation that this has to be the case. And it's related to certain uh, high temperature behavior of free energy obtained by counting states. So this is one lesson that I illustrate to you what we can learn from a deformed partition function of a CFT. I'll try to explain to you other trials that, that have been made. A more natural observable exists in conformal field theory for the, uh, for the, uh, the, the uh, for if, on various curved space or space-time manifold. So especially on conformally flat space or space-time, you can, you can naturally define a conformal field theory there. For, for instance, you can put the system on phi sphere, or you can radially quantize the system and put it on a sphere times a time timeline. So in the latter case, if you're interested in counting local BPS operators or BPS states, you can supersymmetrically comp compactify the time circle and consider the supersymmetric partition functions on sphere times S1. It would be great if I can use string theory to analyze and compute this, but I don't know how to do that, unfortunately. 
So I try to explain to you some kind of things that have been done in the past few years, which is not as, uh, as, uh, uh, as which doesn't sound really good as what I have been explained to you. So I'll try to explain what we did and the status of that kind of uh, business and what, how we should take that. So there has been trial about uh, for a few years ago, including myself, for, of various people, including myself, on trying to make sense of supersymmetric path integral with non-renormalizable effective field theories of these uh, five and six dimensional conformal field theories. These are non-renormalizable, and especially five dimensional young males has been playing some roles, either as deformed five dimensional conformal field theory or the circle compactified six dimensional CFT. Of course, augmented with some non-perturbative correction coming from instantons or spiritually d zero brain. Okay? And it's nonsense, but uh, I can't give you a really logical rational of why we did that, but I can at least tell you some sentiments of why we tried these things and the result that we get out of some uh, endeavors that I'll explain to you. So the supersymmetric path integrals are so nice, so it definitely gives some lots of cancellations between bosonic and fermionic quantum fluctuations. And it's much better than generic ones, even for non renormalizable quantum field theory. So you really, if you really make a careless look, you might think that the result could be finite, could be unambiguous, and you might feel like you can compute it. I think that was a sentiment of many people who did these kind of studies. But if you really look carefully, huh, in most observables which really attempt to say something about higher dimensional physics, have ambiguities in its computations. Naively, one might think, and actually I thought so, that supersymmetric localization is demanding us to identify certain saddle points of path integral and then do a Gaussian path integral over it. So Gaussian path integral I thought I could do without any trouble. At least one kind of fatal ambiguity that I see in this kind of problem is that the saddle point manifold is always having singular configurations in five dimensional space, space or space. Uh, space for which I can't uh, provide any convincing UV completions without doing guesswork. So it's the same kind of singular saddle point configuration we encountered in the partition function of the flat space theory. There, string theory provided good UV completion. It was basically whispering to me to, uh, to uh, saying what to do. Here, I don't have string theory and I'm just alone. Oops. So this is the crucial point I or many of my colleagues had to make guessworks without any logical grounds. Okay? And this is a kind of very similar kind of UV completion, at least at formal level. So by experience that we had on the flat space partition function, we could really make an educated guess to propose a concrete formula for certain observables. Okay? So if you want, pragmatically, you might think of this kind of procedure as proposing a very, very concrete answer for these partition functions, which at the first stage, you can be a bit doubtful, so you test it, test it against lots of data you know about this system by various indirect methods. And at a certain point, if test is sufficient, you can change your mind and try to stare at it to get some more in, 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 interesting information. So I tried to explain to you what kind of lessons I learned by observables whose answers are written down in this manner. So for instance, the superconformal index of the six-dimensional 2-0 theory, we call this BPS partition function superconformal index, is defined by a trace over the local operators with few gases inserted in, with lots of uh, scale dimension, R charges, and angular momentum, and so on. And it takes the form of a finite dimensional integral whose measures incident incidentally take advantages of the tensor branch partition functions that I spent some time to explain to you on alpha times T2 and you integrate over some tensor branch parameters and so on suitably. Okay. There are a couple of alternative versions of proposals made, but I, uh, I, I, I explained to you a definite one. And some consistency test has also, uh, also been made in the early days, some low order expansions in large N, Abelian index, with some guesswork in, 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 in here. And I'm going to explain to you probably thank you, the simplest one that uh, thing that I have learned, because it's a still a very cumbersome expression, but if you make a simplification by turning on certain chemical potential, suddenly you can do an exact calculation, get closed form, and see some physics better. So the simplest setting I have been considering originally with my collaborator, Hitchell Kim, in five years ago, was to turn off as most as big as possible and just keep one of them. 
And the measure turns out to commute with 16 of the 32 supercharges. So I was convinced that I could compute this whatever math way. And actually, I have a very naive and stupid and completely wrong expectation, even before getting to any computations. Uh, I'm just sharing my stupidity because uh, uh, similar confusions are made by lots of my uh, lots of people. And uh, just to sympathize that I was in the same status of confusion. The first stupid confusion was that it, I thought it was associated with half supersymmetry. So I thought it would be counting half BPS operators. This partition function is this. This answer, to, this expectation turned out to be wrong. The second expectation I had was that, OK, I'm computing a partition function on the sphere on curve manifold, so I'm going to have some vacuum at Cassini energy factor, whose leading order ex expression in the larger expansion has been computed by some, uh, compact, computed by some holographic normalization techniques 17 years ago, and has been recomputed by Minahan and Zapdin and collaborators quite recently. This expectation was also wrong. Instead, I got the following quantity, somewhat more complicated than the, what I expected, and the prefactor I got, but with some weird, uh, uh, some different coefficients. I think whenever I got wrong, we got to learn some uh, uh, insightful physics uh, 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 by, by staring at the unexpected answer. The first expectation was stupidly wrong, just because the unrefined version of the index having to do with 16 supersymmetry is not the half BPS partition function. It was just a stupid mistake of mine. But I got this expression. Uh, of course, I did some consistency check, n equal to 1, n equal to infinity against ADS7. So I thought, of, OK, it might not be wrong. It looks good. But I had no idea what I was doing, what I was counting. I had to wait for two more years until Beam and Rastelli and Van Ries came up with a beautiful proposal about the structure of the six-dimensional local, op uh, six local operator spectrum. They were made in a beautiful proposal that there is a subsector of local operators in 6.2.0 theory whose operator products close at, into, into, the, into, into themselves and yield the, what is called the WN algebra. Okay? And they had some uh, 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 strong supporting evidences for that proposal. And more than anything else, good to me, uh, they, pr they gave a beautiful interpretation of this quantity that I was counting at this subclass of operators. So some arguments are in their papers. So at last I got to know that what I was counting was related to this deep structure of the uh, six-dimensional 2-0 theory. Another confusion uh, or mistake, uh, mi wrong expectation I, I made has been uh, resolved quite quickly just because, because the Casimir energies and the Casimir energies appearing in the index has similar characters in nature, but it's intrinsically different. So it's a BPS cousin of Casimir energy, which has to be computed with you know, regularization and normalization, every step respecting supersymmetry. So it's a BPS cousin of the traditional Casimir energy. Okay? And it, I think it was a good chance to bring people the notion of the new kinds of Casimir energy. And there has been a long list of interesting and uh, beautiful studies of them. Uh, it has been so sophisticated, uh, sub, sub field, so I almost lost track of the, 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 the top end thing that is going on. But the key question you might ask is that this is a definite prediction of this quantity, so can you predict, compute this in ADS7 gravity dual? That's a question that still hasn't been solved. Apparently, one aspect of the getting through the answer is to developing a holographic normalization technique uh, in which the supersymmetry is manifest at each stage. Some interesting work has been developed in recent years by Dario Martelli and collaborators, uh, but not at ADS7 at the moment. Okay. In five-dimensional, similar kind of interesting work has been done. Uh, the five-dimensional superconformal index, under the similar spirit, uh, at the moment, I just take it as writing down a proposal, concrete proposal for the answer, by my good collaborators five years ago. Instantly, that it again takes advantage of the Coulomb branch partition function of the five-dimensional CFTs. And it has been used numerously uh, after some initial tests, I think, for exploring lots of interesting UV physics like ultraviolet symmetry enhancements and so on by many, many people. It's practically much easier quantity to, to use than the six-dimensional index I explained to you before. And also on phi sphere, as uh, briefly mentioned by uh, uh, Thomas yesterday as well, Jeffries and Proof had studied uh, a class of uh, superconformal field theories with large end parameters and ADS6 gravity duals. The free energy of ADS6 has a very weird scaling behavior of n to the 5 half, and that has been correctly uh, reproduced by studying 
the larger limit of this partition function, where actually they use some small, very small aspects of this partition function at perturbative level and so on. Good. So I think there is a real virtue of having this concrete proposal, which hopefully could stimulate people to have more concrete thinking, more concrete ideas. So I'm not want to be too ambitious, but uh, I hope this is the answer which better define questions of various sorts in the future. And many other proposals of this sort, I'd be welcome to move forward. And hopefully in the future, somebody might be logically clarifying what this business is all about. So there are other directions. I have five minutes. So I have brief comments about many other in interesting ideas that has been studied to, to current days to a certain extent. But those ideas, which has been relatively old, but I think hasn't been fully explored, especially combined with the recent advances in supersymmetry techniques, these ideas, I think, has a good chance to explore various different aspects of uh, higher dimensional conformal field theories. For, so for the first thing is the discrete light cone quantization of M5 grains, basically com compactifying the system on a light-like torus, light-like circle. And in the momentum K sector, given momentum sector, uh, discrete light cone quantization suggests that this sector is described by a non-relativistic superconformal quantum mechanics, closely related to the quantum mechanics for the D0, D0, D4 system I explained. So some preliminary works have been done about the index of this non-relativistic quantum mechanics, which passes to a certain interesting uh, consistency test, but much more work has been done to be done, I think. The idea of deconstruction also suggests that a four-dimensional N equal to two superconformal field theory with a quiver type in a certain limit of taking the quiver size to be large in the Higgs branch describes, constructs, the extra two dimensions of the six-dimensional two-zero theory on the torus. So if, if you are interested in two-zero theory on the torus, uh, if you engineer interesting observables which are computable and interesting, I think there's a big chance for this idea to be useful. Some interesting works have been done uh, earlier this year. There are another way of constructing M5 brains extra direction, I think. For instance, you can use to try to use certain matrix model either to construct M2 or M5. M2 brains are expected to construct the world, uh, uh, matrix models are expected to construct M2 brains in a specific larger limit, which you can visualize at the classical level. But visualizing M5 brains are much more difficult. And it has been shown that it's, uh, M5 brains are co constructed in a wild quantum level, so you can really can't see at the level of classical geometry. But now we have powerful tools of supersymmetry. I think it's a good time to go back thinking of how to extract out M5 brains, the suitable uh, large end limit here. Also, there are some interesting works that I'm paying attention to. There are also some abstract methods of just computing the elliptic genera of the strings from uh, uh, the basic structures like modularity required on this object. Uh, there are interesting progress being initiated some years ago. There have been more intuitive studies of instanton operators, which has more lights on five or six dimensional symmetry enhancements and so on. So I'm gonna conclude. Uh, 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 non-Lagrangian quantum field theory or non-perturbative quantum field theory are really highlighting the limitations of either our current formulation of quantum field theories or our technical controls over them. And I think that quantum field theories in higher dimensions are encoding such those kinds of limitations in very essential manners. Okay? And despite many constraints, I try to explain to you that we can explore some quantitative quantum questions by maximally using the tools available to us. And there are further questions that we can address. Uh, I'll finish by listing them, some of the questions I think are important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this comprehensive overview. And are there any questions? Yuji. Um, I have a question about your uh, S-duality anomaly formula. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was it the observation from the computation of the e uh, e index, or is, do you have an intrinsic derivation of that I derived transformation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah. I, I, I explained to you how the coefficient transform right. the S-duality anomaly. So from that, I know essentially, I mean, with some technical, technical difficulties, how the, this quantity transforms. 
and in this limit, the free energy transformation is basically derived from this. So, I see. so basically, if you trace the trace the these lines of uh, uh, derivation, what appears here? Oh, sorry, I didn't. This is the intersection number of a n minus right. one gauge group, and this is uh, the vial vector. This is actually uh, in correspondence with uh, anomaly polynomial four form. This what is it? This this right. Green term of yeah. the anomaly, uh, where field strengths are replaced by chemical potentials. If you trace this, it was a derivation. You can show that this originates from the square of this. Uh -huh. So I have a real derivation, more than one derivation and more supporting checks in series okay. extensions and so on. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll ask one. Uh, at, at various points, you mentioned uh, the computation could also be done in the dual supergravity. How is this done on an explicit uh, solution? At some point, oh, you said oh, maybe, yeah, 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 some spectrum, maybe. So the, yeah. the, the larger limit of this. Yeah. Also, you expand the gravity fields, various supergravity fields in ADS seven times S4 at quadratic level and read off the Kaluza-Klein spectrum. Okay. So you compute the index from that. Okay. Yeah. Did you have a question, Ofa? So do, do these methods help you in any way in classifying these theories? I mean, even just for the two zero theories in six dimensions, can you learn anything about the classification of the theories? Classification, um, 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 by doing these kind of studies? Uh, not really, <laughs> I don't think so, yeah. At the moment, no. Any more? I don't see any, so let's thank uh, Seok again. There was one.